couple of things to address before we get started, but welcome to the Rosids 2 Basal Asterids and Asterids 1 Part A. <laughs> Somewhat convoluted, uh, a bunch of angiosperms, uh, as we'll call it. Um, for the presenters, um, I'll be moderating the uh, first half of the talks. Um, so at 12 minutes, I'll kind of wave at you and try to get your attention. Um, it's somewhere between 13 and 14 minutes. I will creep up here next to you. And then at 15 minutes, I'll start um, stiff arming you off of the stage. So um, just fair warning, uh, we're gonna try to um, stick to the schedule as closely as we um, possibly can. Um, so, with no further ado, our first speaker will be uh, Doug Soltis talking about some big questions with roses. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for coming, and I'll try not to go over. Um, so, really, my main goal mm -hmm. is to use the rosid clade as an example of the difficulties that I think we're encountering in handling or tackling uh, some of the immense challenges in the angiosperms. And this is actually supposed to be the second of a Rosa talk. The first one is actually scheduled for Wednesday. <laughs> okay, so then I'll advertise that later, but I'm going to give the uh, phylogenetic underpinnings. So I want to give special thanks right away to people who did a lot of this work because there's a lot of informatics behind what I'm going to talk about, and they deserve a ton of credit. And the Al Sun, pictured right there, will give the Rosa part one a talk on Wednesday. That'll have a lot more details on the phylogeny that I'm going to present only briefly today. So I want to start out first by just stressing, as I think you all know, the importance of big trees. Big trees allow us to do things, big comprehensive trees, that we can't do with small trees. Just like this poor guy can't get on the uh, Ferris wheel, he's just not big enough. Uh, you have to have a tree that's comprehensive and large to address some of the big, comparative, massive questions that we want to address, some of the grand challenges we want to address in biology. And that's what we'd actually hoped to do with the roses. We thought there's some great ecological niche evolution questions we can address with the roses because they're such a key clay of angiosperms. But you will see we failed, uh, or fa are failing, just because of the sheer size of this clay and the, la the lack of available data. And so I think that's the point that I want to make. The angiosperms, uh, we reached success very early in building a framework. And this has given rise, misguided, I think, to sort of an angiosperm envy. My point will be that the angiosperms are really very poorly understood as we move to the tips. And that's where the title comes in, Wrestling with the Roses, a huge clade of about 87,000 species. But this is a major driver of, of terrestrial biodiversity. It's also of major economic and ecological importance, great fossil records. There are lots of great reasons to study the roses, but you will see they remain poorly understood at all levels. Despite the opportunities, this presents challenges. I'm going to use this as a test case to show what those challenges in the state of biological infrastructure is for this big part of the angiosperm tree of life. But the bottom line is, if you fall asleep, that these problems and the lack of knowledge that we have for a clay of this importance are really going to hinder global terrestrial biodiversity synthesis until we learn more about this clay. So just to uh, reiterate, we as a community rapidly uh, reached a framework for the angiosperms, through NSF support, the tree of life, the monocot tree of life, and here you can see the APG4 clay. But this is a framework tree, right? So the framework for the angiosperms is well understood. Well, even the parts of the framework are being problematic. But our understanding of the framework of the angiosperms has continued to be bolstered by other projects like the 1KP, 1,000 plant transcriptomes projects. There's a lot of plastome genome sequencing going on in China. Q has a big project. <coughs> Here we see a plastid tree that our lab has generated with 1KP data for over 2,000 green plants. About 1,000 of those are angiosperms, which all sounds great. But again, that is the angiosperm framework. And what we have, I think, is a false fact. Because the framework of the angiosperms is well understood, people think that the angiosperms in general are well understood. A false fact is something that 
Stephen Jay Gould used to talk about in some of his writing, and I think it's very appropriate here. Here are a couple of quotes that I've actually taken from proposals where people have used the angiosperms as a model to say they want to be like the angiosperms. Despite their rich history and vital roles in almost all, yeah, I'm covering these up so people are not mad at me. Uh, <laughs> X are overlooked and understudied relative to the flowering plants. This completeness and depth of biological information for group X may only be surpassed by terrestrial vertebrates and some flowering plants. And if you do the stats, and we did in both cases, both of the groups are much better studied than the roses. Both of these were funded, by the way. Okay, um, but even well-studied clays, like the, this was pointed out that the Saxifer dailies was an example of a well-studied angiosperm from a clay a few years ago. Um, the coverage was really very poor. 37% of the species actually had DNA data. It's much better now because of Ryan Folk's work, but um, this is a clade of about 2,500 species, just showing uh, that really many, most parts of the angiosperm tree of life are poorly understood. Nonetheless, this is what most people view the world. This is taken from the Jungle Book. You probably could sing along with me with King Louie. I want to be like you, ooh, ooh, thinking that everybody wants to be like the angiosperms. And I think the point that we we're going to make by using the rosid clay as an example is you really don't want to be like the angiosperms. You probably already have more data than the angiosperms, especially the rosids. So getting back to the rosids, they have about 20% of all angiosperms. This is a rapid radiation we know from earlier molecular studies, confirmed by recent studies that Niao has done, and he'll tell you about more on Wednesday. But this clay is a major driver of terrestrial ecosystems. When you think about it, most forest trees, most forest lineages, their origin, this rapid radiation, coincides with the dominance, the rise in dominance of angiosperm forests. Other terrestrial lineages then came to dominance in the shadow of the angiosperms. And that's what they say. They, really do they came to dominance in the shadow of the roses. We're talking about lineages like the ferns, the, some mammals, many insects, amphibians. They owe their success to the rise of the roses. So we, we built a large tree <coughs> of about 20,000 species of roses. Yeah, I will tell you more about that, and that looks like a really impressive tree, and wow, it must be really well covered, 20,000 species is huge, and it is a great tree, but when you do the math, here we are, let's just look at the second line, uh, there are actually a few more species that, than we, we, that we could have used in building this tree, we could have gone up to 29,000 that might have had usable data, but that's really only 34% of roses have phylogenetically usable data in GenBank. 21% of those are from one family, the Fabaceae. So this is in stark contrast to much better sampled clays that say they want to be like the angiosperms, the vertebrates, and butterflies. Look at the percent coverage that those have. And both of those are rapidly increasing to over 75%. Really, rosin coverage is more comparable to basal land plants. I'm talking about bryophytes. Firms, think we, things we think are poorly covered. So the roses are very poorly covered. Not only that, the coverage is dark and disturbing. So what do, you, what do I mean by that? So if you look at this tree, what we did is in yellow is Meow's five gene tree. Those are the species plotted on the open tree of life of all roses. So you can see the blue is where we have no sampling. And what you can see is that despite what we thought might have been random sampling, it's far from random, it's highly biased. And also there are huge parts of the rosy tree of life that are completely dark. And this shows just how bad some of that sampling is. Look at some of these large clades of life, the Malvales, where we only have 27%, the Mertales, 25%, Sapindales, 35%. These are huge clades where our sampling of it's very, very poor. You can see this even more profoundly at the species level. These are the Rosen family's top 10 most poorly represented. I should have said, this is just the bottom 10, but these are the worst 10 sampled families. Look at this, the Melisomataceae, 5% coverage, the Rosaceae, these are huge families, the Rosaceae, look at the number of species, 6% coverage, the Myrtaceae, this is what we're dealing with in the roses, and this is why global synthesis is so difficult at this level. So not only is it difficult to build a big tree that is really meaningful, 
this also extends to our ability to pull in other data, and this is a huge effort, where we were trying to re really reconstruct global distribution maps and environmental niche characterizations across the roses. So what we did, and by we I mean mainly Ryan Folk, uh, accumulated one million spatially referenced rosid records. These have all been uh, placed in GBIF. But really, when you look at that, only 12,000, mainly about 12,000 species have more than 30 spatial records. You really need about 50 spatial records to do anything meaningful, by the way. 30 would be a minimum cutoff. And these are really biased towards the temperate zone. How biased? Here's our map showing where these are distributed. Uh, the red listed species are in red and the other ones are in green. But you can see we have a lot of uh, knowledge or a lot of distribution points in Europe, parts of North America, Australia. Is this really representative of where all the rosids occur? Well, of course not. This is highly biased. This is more work that Ryan did. What is missing? Well, here's where most of the, where are most of the rosids? A lot of them are here in tropical South America. There's a huge amount in, Ch in China and Asia. And of course, those reference, those data are not yet referenced. We don't have those available. We can't do anything with those yet. So again, a huge amount of data is missing. This prevented us from doing any big synthesis with the roses. We can see the numbers here. These are sampling statistics for available point occurrence data, just showing how poorly uh, represented the roses are when we try to go in and obtain data to do anything ecological with it. 35%, 36%, 20 You can read these numbers. I don't have to read them for but these are low values, and what this means is that we cannot do anything at a meaningful level, despite the great importance of this clay at a, at a global scale of reconstructing ecological niche, looking at ecological uh, evolution. None of those things can be done with this low level of sampling. So I guess what I want to stress is my major point is we should be thinking, um, especially if you like plants and like flowering plants like I do, that no lineage should be left behind. Uh, and roses are one of the great stories of terrestrial radiations, but they're poorly understood at all levels. But I think the results that I've shown you are probably representative, you have big asterid clay, big parts of the Monica tree of life. All of those are terribly underrepresented if you took the time to go in and dig out all of the data as we, as we, <laughs> as we, people like Brian and uh, Charlotte and Meow did uh, in, in our study. The problem with this is um, that I think we need a reversal of fortune. If we go back, I don't know if you can read this here, but if we go back to King Louis, we really should be singing the other way around. After a decade of progress on other groups, it's really now the angiosperms that need to be saying, we need to be like the vertebrates, the butterflies, the basal land plants, et cetera because they are extending to the tips. They are getting deep coverage to over 70 or 80% of all species, while we lag behind at the 20 and 30% level, just because of the sheer size of the angiosperm for 400,000 species. So sing the song with me tonight. I want to, especially if you work on angiosperms, I want to be like you when you see your vertebrate, <laughs> butterfly, insect, loving friend. So in summary, uh, angiosperm envy. Let's throw it out. <coughs> Let's bag it. Forget it. Because angiosperms remain very poorly understood. Sure, we have genomes here and there, but at the tips, we are falling way behind. And we've used the roses as an example of that. They're a huge clay. They're a major driver of terrestrial biodiversity. Of course, major economic and ecological importance. Great fossil records. So we should be able to do lots of fantastic things with them. But we can't because they're so poorly understood at all levels. And as other major clades of life move to the tips, the roses, and I would argue other big swaths of the angiosperms, much of the monocot tree, much of the asteroid clay, lag behind. We need to change that. Because these angiosperm clades are the true drivers of terrestrial biodiversity. This is what the amphibians, this is what the ferns, this is what the butterflies are responding to. So you cannot have biodiversity synthesis until we know more about these clades. So thanks again to the people who really did a lot of the work, and thanks for coming and listening. Thank you. Just I think we have time for one question okay. while we get the next talk set up. David.